Hello and welcome back to Leader Up, a podcast of Army Management Staff College. Leader Up is a professional conversation where we discuss a broad range of leadership and leader development topics with an emphasis on the Army civilian profession. I'm your host, David Howie. On today's episode of Leader Up, we've got a really great guest, a good friend of mine, and a, a just a great American hero. And this is Mr. Mark Schmidt from the Army Management Staff College Department of Organizational Leadership. And we're going to talk to him today about the intermediate course. And I know folks out there in the Leader Up audience that have had him or seen him uh, remember him and, and value all the things that he does for the civilian education program. So Mark Schmidt, hello and welcome to Leader Up. We're glad to have you with us today. Well, thank you, David. I appreciate it. I, I look forward to spending some time with you and, and this is a wonderful invitation and it's a great way to start my new year. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. And um, the first thing I want to talk about is um, we're going to talk about the intermediate course curriculum and this is kind of gauged towards let's say people who have completed the intermediate course, either in person or virtual, because we've had both over the past several years and you've done both. And you and I have taught together both virtually and in person. So the first thing I'd I'd like to hear you talk about is um, one of the first things that's done and that's student goals. And uh, just talk about how that is, how that's done, what the purpose is of that, and kind of what that looks like, uh, either virtually or in the classroom. Yeah, David, thank you. Um, On day one, in both the resident course and our online course, we ask students to identify two goals that they want to work on while they're in the intermediate course. And these goals are not necessarily uh, long-term goals. As an example, sometimes students might say they want to complete a master's degree, a technical degree. What we ask students to do is to work on or identify something that they want to work on while they're in the intermediate course. And oftentimes what I tell students is, let's say, as an example, uh, you get nervous when you're talking in front of a group of people. So a student goal might be, I want to work on public speaking. And even in the online environment, we may not be standing in front of people. We still have students present ideas, thoughts, projects. And it's an opportunity for people to practice their skills of speaking in front of other people. So it's geared more towards those things that they can work on during the course. Uh, That's important because it's not something that we're imposing on the students. It's something that we're asking them to participate in the process of learning in the intermediate course. Because the intermediate course is not uh, a typical Army class. And I'm not, please don't take that as a pejorative statement about Army training and education. But when students come to our course, more often than not, they are surprised um, that we ask them a lot of questions. We don't lecture to them. And that's because we do, uh, uh, we follow the principles of adult learning. And part of those principles of adult learning are having students take responsibility for their education. And when they identify their goals, that's exactly what they're doing. They're taking responsibility for their own learning throughout the three-week course. And at the end, whatever they find personally beneficial, whatever they discover for themselves, and whatever they experience and the feedback they get from their table mates, as well as the facilitators, that will encourage folks to learn in the environment that we are in. So goals are very important in that they're not imposed, but it's something that the students can work on throughout the course. And we do that on on day one of the course. And the format for those goals is very, also very specific. And there's, I, if I, if I remember correctly, there are three different components to, to that activity of laying out the goals. And so can you just address what those are and why they're done that way? Yeah, there are three parts to that, David. The first part is identify what the goal is, describe that to us, and then describe to us what does success look like? In other words, to accomplish that goal, what does it look like? Describe that to us. And then the the final part of that is, how can others help? And when I say others, it's not just the facilitators in the room. We group the students in what we call table groups, and they work with the same group throughout the three weeks that they're in the course. 
they have opportunities to receive feedback from their colleagues. And the colleagues, once folks understand what other folks' goals are, we can help folks achieve those goals. And that's a key component with the intermediate course. And sometimes students are sometimes reticent about revealing what their goals are. But what we find is if we have a student identify a goal and then tell somebody else what that goal is, there's an accountability mechanism there. Because ultimately what happens is sometime during the day or throughout the week, one of their table mates will come up and ask them, how are you doing on that goal? And sometimes students will lament about that because now they have somebody else that's holding them accountable to achieve that goal. So we ask those three questions to to get a baseline of what success looks like. How can we help for a person to achieve those goals? So those are the three questions that we ask them to answer. And, And sometimes people will say, or students will say something like, correct me if I'm wrong, they'll say, I want to make sure that I'm not overbearing during group discussions or that I'm not imposing my will or that I'm not taking over uh, a meeting because they maybe in their workplace, they feel like they do that. And so they'll ask, they'll tell the other students how they can help. And it's basically uh, tell me if you feel like I'm doing that. And, and I've seen that happen. I've seen them get the feedback to say, Hey, let us finish the discussion before, you know, you, you said that's your goal. So we're still kind of discussing what we're doing. So don't just jump in and tell us what we're going to do. Is that, is that uh, in line with the kind of things you've seen? Absolutely. And I think I see that every day. In the resident classroom, obviously the facilitators are in the classroom. So we get to observe the students daily. And I see those interactions occur quite often. There's often a very candid dialogue that happens at the table groups. And it's not just in the classroom. Because when we're in residence, folks are riding to and from the classroom, from the hotel together. They're eating in the evenings together. So there's a lot of opportunity for feedback. Even in the online environment, though, I'm seeing opportunity for students to provide that feedback because we do group activity work in the online environment as well. And what I've found is students will continually meet in their groups, even in week three. Week three, we transition to wholly individual activities. However, The students find such a benefit of working with their table groups, they will continue to meet, uh, to share ideas, uh, to get some feedback, uh, to use other folks as a sounding board. So in that environment, it absolutely does occur. And it's the safe environment that students create themselves. Because what I found is we have some very professional folks that come to the intermediate course, and they range from many different backgrounds. But when they come together, they are invested in their learning. And part of that occurs on day one, because once they realize that it's not, we're going to lecture to you, we're going to impose our ideas on you, but we want you to identify your goals and learn for yourself, it opens up a whole new avenue of learning for folks. And what I see are students taking advantage of that. And they're not afraid, uh, and they're often encouraged to provide feedback to their table mates, because it's all about learning together. And it's, uh, it's a wonderful environment to see in action. And something that I've seen is that invariably throughout the course, there are opportunities and ways for every student to work on those goals. Somewhere in the curriculum, we touch something, if it's conflict or listening uh, or teamwork or something like that, we, we always provide some kind of a, a vehicle for that student to address one of their goals. That's correct, David. And what's interesting is we also have the students do pre-work. And part of the pre-work that they do before they come to the course is identify two goals. Now, we will refine those or ask the students to refine those when they come to the course because we'll give them some more guidance. But as facilitators, we have an idea when students come to the course, perhaps what one of their goals or two of their goals might be. And what we can do through facilitation and dialogue, we can ask the students a little bit more And it can be as something as simple as, could you elaborate on that goal to allow us to understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish? And what's interesting is sometimes students will write a goal on day one, but by day five in the course, they might realize that's really not the goal that I want to work on. The goal that I want to work on is this, because what they've done over the course of maybe three or four days, they've received some feedback. They either had a realization themselves through some reflection 
or some type of experience in the classroom, they realize, you know what, that's really not my goal. The reality is my goal is this. So really in the first week of the course, it's self-awareness week. That's the theme of the week. Uh, Students will make some connections and sometimes they'll change their goals. And more often than not, the facilitators will will encourage students to do that. What we ask them to do, though, is if you're going to change your goal, let us all know. Because, again, what does success look like and how can we help you achieve that goal? So it's a very dynamic environment, in my experience. And we we also kind of prime that self-awareness pump um, even earlier between the pre-work and the goals with introductions because we, we, in the intermediate course, we go past the quote unquote, I've climbed count, uh, Mount Kilimanjaro eight times in the past five years kind of thing to, we talk more intimately with the students and ask them other questions for their introductions. So c- can you just talk about that and how that connects in with their goals? Absolutely. The first question we ask them is, who are you? It seems like a simple question, but I always caveat that by saying, particularly in the resident course, who are you really? And that just opens up. How students choose to answer that is absolutely up to them. And it's interesting what students will share with us. Oftentimes, what will happen in the resident course as well as online, um, a facilitator will go first and model perhaps the behavior. And depending upon how we model our introduction, the students will typically mirror that introduction. So as a facilitator, I can go into some detail about my background of who I am. And oftentimes the students will respond in kind. We can do that in the online environment as well, because I'll post my introduction online. So it's wide open for the students to introduce themselves as who you are. But we model that behavior. They think about it. And it's amazing to me what students will share on that first day. We also ask them, when it comes to leadership, what are your strengths? We also ask them, when it comes to leading others, what some of your challenges might be. And I'm always struck on day one at how open people are to describing those things. Um, it's, it's a very rich environment because students will say a gamut of things. You know, I'm really strong in this, but you know what? I'm sensing I have some challenges here. And what's interesting to me is we always couch it as challenges, but the students will say weaknesses. And we, we try to steer them away from weaknesses, but it's, it's what challenges do you have? And I'm always amazed and surprised at how open folks are. And it's an indicator to me that when students come to the intermediate course, they are invested in learning something when they come. And part of that occurs on the morning of week one, because we set the stage. We create that environment together, not just facilitators, but it's students. We create an environment where people feel comfortable. Uh, they can open up. And I see that happening, and it, it's very interesting, and it's um, it's very worthwhile when you see that occur. And I know that a lot of uh, folks, when they come into any military or army um, leadership course, they they have sometimes they will have this this preconceived notion that military leadership is standing on the front of your tank with a flag you know, and charging into battle, screaming and yelling at everybody. And um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but um, that's not necessarily the kind of leadership that's called for in in every environment. And what, what I've seen is when the students start laying out their leadership goals or their leadership uh, competencies, capabilities, or strengths, they start to hear that everyone has something to bring to the table. Everyone has some skill to, to apply leadership uh, in the workplace. Okay. Let me, let me move forward, uh, Mark to the end of week one or the end of block one activity, uh, that you guys do. And, and it's called the assessment activity. And just talk about that a little bit, why that's done and how that's connected back to student goals. Absolutely. So at the end of week one, and it it occurs in the afternoon of day five, which is Friday. So this is the last activity that we'll do before we we, uh, take a break for the weekend. And what we ask the students to do is to consider the learning that has occurred over the course of the week and how they have been able to either work on or achieve their goals throughout the week. We ask students to graphically depict or draw a picture 
of their learning throughout the course of the week. And it's a fantastic activity because we literally will take what we call butcher paper. It's about a two by four piece of paper. We give it to the students, it's blank, and we ask them to draw something. And we provide materials in the classroom that include colors, colored markers, uh, glitter, anything that the students will bring into class. And we ask them to essentially describe their learning. Now, they have to answer the questions that we ask them, but associate that with the, the drawings that they do. And it's important because it allows the students to consider, I've identified these goals at the beginning of the week on week one. And by week five or day five, it's an opportunity for them to consider, have I actually had some movement towards achieving my goal? Now, the idea is after about four days, they may not have actually achieved that goal, but it's important to consider how are we moving towards that goal? Or if a student has changed a goal throughout the course of the week, how has their perspective changed? And that can be very important because that will then set up what they do in week two when we go to team development to consider how do we take our table group, all these individuals, the different goals that we have, how do we weave this together to form a more powerful team in team development week? So it looks back in one sense that we're looking at your goals and what you learned throughout the course of the week, but it also looks forward because now that you've gone through this self-awareness, we move into team development week. How do I, as an individual contributor with a little bit more self-awareness, how can I come together with my table group, weave ourselves together, and form a more powerful team as we go forward in team development week? So it's a, it's a fun activity. It's one of my favorites. And I oftentimes see a lot of, I see emotion there. I mean, genuine emotion. And again, it's this environment that the students and the facilitators create together in the intermediate course that allows students to feel safe where they can have that emotion. And it, it's, it's really a beautiful thing to see. And if, if we accept uh, the David Kolb uh, theory of learning, emotion through those powerful experiences is the way that we get to true deep learning. Uh, and that's what the experiential learning model is all about, in, in my opinion. And kind of what I've seen with those uh, end of week one, block one synthesis things is kind of like what you're saying. It's not so much that they've checked the block on that goal, but they've, they've understood more what the goal is about and why it's important. And they're starting to see how other people around them can help them if they are open, uh, and, and are genuine about accomplishing those goals that they've set out for themselves. And let's go ahead, Mark. You look like you're, you've got another thing say, to add. Yeah, David, I appreciate it. It can be eye opening for students because when students come to the course, they may feel that uh, they are dealing with problems, issues, things within their office space. That they themselves are the only people experiencing this. And what happens is when they come to the intermediate course and they talk to their table mates, what they realize is they are not alone. And it is so empowering because through that professional dialogue that they have with their table mates, the facilitators, they realize that they are not alone. And that's empowering because now people can really open up and talk and they can learn from one another. And that's the key thing with adult learning. It's not that I am imposing the army way of doing things, but I'm allowing students to bring their experiences to the table so that they can learn together. And through that, students realize I am not alone. And they start to build connections, connections that I think I've seen will persist past the intermediate course. I have had students put together Facebook pages. Uh, we're talking about having an, an alumni program where students can stay in contact, not just with the facilitators in the college, but with their table mates. And I see evidence of people continuing to remain engaged with their table mates even after the intermediate course graduation. And so let me, let me close out this discussion about the goals and that end of week one or block one assessment activity. So if, if I'm an intermediate course student, former student who graduated two, three, even five years ago, what should I do now regarding the goals that I set and, and how I assess them at the end of that first week or that first block? I would revisit them. And 
just because we've gone through week one and and we talked about self awareness in week one, the self awareness does not end at week one. It continues. It persists throughout the course, and then it also persists once folks get back to their work environments. I would encourage folks to go back and review if they still have them. What were my goals? How am I doing on those? And again, we ask students to focus on what they can accomplish in the three weeks, but that doesn't mean that they've accomplished it in those three weeks, but they may have sent a foundation so that they can continue their development. I would encourage folks to go back and look at those. And if they've achieved those, what are your next set of goals? Continue to challenge ourselves to identify goals and meet those goals as we develop individually and we become a contributor to the team. So I would encourage folks to go back and if you've got them, take a look at those goals and, and see how you're doing. And could, could you imagine how powerful it would be to see three, four, or five intermediate course graduates, uh, maybe one graduated from a virtual course a year ago, two or three graduated two or three years ago, uh, and they're comparing their goals and talking about how things are going for them in the workplace. That, that would be the ultimate uh, learning transfer concept, would it not? Absolutely. And if that dialogue continues, then they're experiencing some team learning, not just in the intermediate course, but at their workplace. And if they can experience the same dialogue, the same environment where they feel free to share ideas at their workplace, then I believe we probably accomplished something and it can be very beneficial. And that's what I challenge students. I will tell students at each of these gates, as an example at the week one assessment, day five, I'll tell them, if you're enjoying some aspect of the intermediate course, there's something here that just is really working for you. Your challenge is how can you transfer that or export it to your workplace? And I don't think that ever stops. There's always that challenge to figure out how can we accomplish things better within our workplace. And what I tell students, if, if you could just do one thing to make your life a little bit better, why wouldn't you do that? They don't have to be big things. But what things, little things, can you make changes to just to improve your work environment? And I think that's, that's probably a key component of what we do in the intermediate course, are helping them identify those things. And let's jump forward to the, towards the end of the course, uh, the, that activity that's now called the capstone activity. And just what, what is that? What's that all about? And what's the purpose of that? So the capstone activity, I often refer to that as the return on investment. What we ask students to do in week three, um, and the theme of week three is improve the organization and accomplish the mission. Or actually, it's accomplish the mission and improve the organization, depending upon how you want to approach it. And the capstone, we ask them to identify perhaps an issue that they have within their organization. Call it a problem. Sometimes folks are very reticent about identifying a problem within their organization because the word problem itself, uh, you say that word and, and people immediately think negative things. What I tell students is, this would be an awesome problem. If you have a high-performing organization, but you want a higher-performing organization, if those two things don't match your current state and your desired end state, there's incongruency there. That's a heck of a good problem to have, right? I have a high-performing team, but I want to make it even more high-performing. So what we ask students to do through some systems analysis, um, we, do, we, we ask them to do a very simple systems analysis, apply some systems thinking to identify a couple of problem areas within their organization that they can address. And then in week three, using all the tools that they've learned or experienced in the intermediate course, we ask them to develop a plan to address those things over a six to 12 month time period, depending upon what is most appropriate for them. We have the students brief that at the capstone presentations, and they get some feedback from their table mates. They get a chance to practice what they might actually take back to their organization. And the return on investment for us is, and I've had students call me and tell me that they did this. They took the same two slides as an example that they presented at the capstone, and they took it into the office and briefed their supervisor on where they see some problem areas. And it's, it's, uh, it's the key component of the capstone that it's, it starts a dialogue. Some of the students may not be supervisors, but they can certainly talk to their supervisor and start that dialogue. They can also start a dialogue with people that work to their left and their right. What I'm finding is 
the longer I've been in AMSC, I see students from some of the same organizations. And what I'm realizing is there is actually this network of former intermediate course students that are out there. And I think the key thing that students can do back in their organizations are seek those folks out and start developing contact with them. Start asking them about what they see because they can take their capstone activity, share it with those folks and see if they are seeing the same things. They're actually starting to develop a coalition. People who are like-minded who might want to achieve some change within their organization. So the capstone itself is the return on investment. It's something they can take from our classroom to their organization and say, this is something I think we can work on. That's the key component of the capstone. And I, w- I want to talk to you about uh, su- the supervisor's role and supervisor engagement. But before we get to that, I, w- I would like to talk to you about conflict. And-, and I want to talk about that specifically because in the goals, that's that's a it's not always described as conflict, but it's a it's a theme uh, of there's some conflict. It's either with with other people or within me, there's some conflict going on that I'm uncomfortable with. And so just w- when is conflict addressed in the intermediate course? How is it addressed? And I know that there's a specific instrument that's used to deal with conflict. So if you could just address uh, all of those things. Absolutely. So we talk about conflict in week two. And what's interesting is, from my experience of working in the resident course, not so much online because we don't experience too much conflict online, but in the resident course, conflict will actually occur in the classroom. Now, I hope anybody listening to this will go, oh my goodness, I don't want to go to the intermediate course because conflict occurs. You just have to think about it. When you put a group of people together, working on a project, working on some type of activity, at some point, uh, conflict will occur. And there are three types that we talk about. Intrapersonal. In other words, I'm just not comfortable with what's happening right now. I can't describe it, but I have this feeling that something's not quite right. You might have interpersonal conflict with another person where we disagree and, and we're having some conflict. And then because we have table groups, we can also have intergroup conflict where different table groups may be experiencing a little bit of conflict between them. And what we talk about in week two is that conflict is neither good nor bad. It's it's essentially what it is. The key component, particularly if you're a leader, is how do you respond to it? And the instrument that we use to to help students kind of understand what conflict is, is the strength deployment inventory. And it's based upon the work of, of Dr. Elias Porter and what he calls the relationship awareness theory. And the strength deployment inventory is a wonderful instrument because it allows us to see ourselves when things are going well. And then it also allows us to see ourselves when things are not going so well. And so what the instrument gives us some indicators are, what are those things that motivate us? And then when our motivations change, when we're in conflict, where do we go? That's important for us to understand that. But what's cool about the way that we do it in the intermediate course is, Through our facilitation, students get an opportunity to hear where other people go, what their motivations are. And that can be very illuminating because now all of a sudden the behaviors that they see in their colleagues are demystified to some degree. What I always say in class is you don't have to write Bob off as an idiot. No, Bob's not an idiot. Bob is motivated in something other than you. So the behavior you're seeing is just a manifestation of that, those motives. And then when people go into conflict, it helps us to understand what's important to folks. And if we can understand what folks' motivations are, we can perhaps arrive at a better result. In other words, the conflict doesn't spiral out of control. We can keep it to the lowest level. And we start talking about what motivates us, what's important to us. We can learn through that. And indeed, through that conflict, we can understand what's important to other folks. And now that I understand what you're concerned about, you understand what I'm concerned about. Maybe now that we've talked about it, had this dialogue, we can achieve a better result. And that occurs in week two because in the group work that we do, it's about week two that if conflict is going to occur at the table groups, it's probably going to occur in week two. And that's the perfect time to talk about it. In fact, we ask students to identify where have you experienced conflict in the class. And we ask them to talk about it and talk about it openly. Because if we can, we can resolve the conflict and we can move forward. 
So that's a key component with our curriculum. And the strength deployment inventory is, is a tool that we use to help identify and help people see themselves, as well as the people to their left and their right, what motivates them when things are going well and what motivates them when they're in conflict. And what that instrument does and in, in, in what I've seen is that it gives them a language to talk about, to address and to understand conflict. And they'll say things such as, now I kind of understand why you got real quiet for about a day last week, or now I understand why you did this or that last week. And then they can see other people's behaviors through a different uh, lens than just their own. So they can understand other people's um, actions. And um, one of the, one of the slides, one of my favorite slides, I think we used to call it the Nerf ball slide where it says, um, I judge myself by my intentions and you judge me by my external actions. Cause that's all you can see. Um, and I think that, that, that helps students Absolutely. understand, understand conflict and why conflict. And, and like you said, it's not good or bad. It's there. What makes it good or bad is how we address it and how we learn to, to deal with it. And what's interesting is I actually had a student come to class and was so excited to engage with the strength deployment inventory because he had coworkers who had come through the class and already done the SDI. And now that student had an opportunity to learn what their motivational value system and conflict sequence was. And he was excited about that because now he could actively participate in the discussions that were happening back in his organization because his cohorts or his, his colleagues were using the language that you're talking about. And I thought that was wonderful because I'm seeing that, yes, folks are going out there and using this as a tool to maybe help themselves uh, relate to folks better. And so let's, let's kind of move, uh, move a little forward uh, in the course to uh, towards the very end, something that's referred to as supervisor engagement. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to assume that this is going to be connected possibly to the capstone activity. Um, what is that supervisor engagement concept? What is that all about and what does it look like uh, for in the workplace? So the supervisor engagement, the idea is now that a student, now that you've been in the course for three weeks, at some point, whether you take some leave or you go right back the following Monday, you are going to reintegrate back into the organization. And the boss is probably going to ask you a simple question. How did it go? What are you going to say? So we spend some time with the students in week three to set that up. In fact, we ask them to write down what their top five takeaways are. Because let's say they have an office call with the boss uh, sometime when they get back. But they run into the boss in the hallway and the boss says, how did it go? They can pull those five takeaways out. And say, well, here's some five things that I took away from the intermediate course that were important to me. So it sets up that dialogue. And then the supervisor engagement is going into the boss's office, perhaps with your capstone activity, starting a dialogue. But it's trying to transfer those things that are most important to you. And each student is going to have something different. Each student is going to take something away differently based upon who they are, where they work, even their boss. And that's the cool part of it. There's, there's no cookie cutter solution. Go into the boss and figure out, okay, here are my top takeaways. Here are some areas where I think we can improve, and it starts that dialogue. And that's the important piece. That's the return on investment. It's not just that I went to the intermediate course, but the expectation, the idea is I'm going to go back and I'm going to attempt to make some change within my organization. And the way I couch it is don't think you're going to go back there and, and, and change huge things within your organization. But what we're trying to identify are one or two things that I have some control over that I might be able to interact with. To make that change. Um, I call it my pebble theory of change. Just look for some pebbles that you can drop into the pond, create some ripples. And as those ripples go throughout the organization, you can start to affect some change. So that's the supervisor engagement to get that dialogue going so that maybe we can use the tools that we learned in the intermediate course to achieve some change. I remember uh, one time I had a student who, and this comes up a lot, uh, it was one of their goals was to improve their public speaking skills. And at the end of the course, they said that they wanted to talk to their supervisor about that when they went back 
and they were going to ask to be able to do the, the safety briefings at the end of the week or the end of the month. Something that simple, but it's, and that's, that's an example of that pebble idea that you're talking about, because I believe that something small, that's successful begets more success. So in learning how to accomplish a goal and overcome a challenge breeds more accomplishing of goals and more overcoming challenges rather than just quote unquote stasis or just allowing things to stay as they are. So we're not, and it, correct me if, if you see this differently, but in my opinion, I'm not looking for folks to go back and change the world. I'm looking for them to do what they can to make themselves a little bit better, but to also share that with other people so that they see the changes that, that they're making in themselves. Absolutely. I tell students it's uh, this idea of persistent patience because sometimes they'll say things and, and people will not immediately rally around maybe their ideas. That's cool because people are, are trying to kind of understand, okay, wh- what's really going on here? Be persistent. Be patient. Uh, don't be overbearing because when we reintegrate back into our organization after three weeks of being in an intermediate, intermediate course, um, somebody else has been doing my job. Somebody else has been doing those things that I do. So they don't sometimes want to hear immediately what you learned in the intermediate course. Just give it some time, uh, build up to it, allow other people to kind of uh, warm up to those ideas. And the other thing I'll tell students is sometimes you can affect change by simply demonstrating the behavior that you want to see in others. In other words, become the example. If there are things that really meant that much to you here, just do it. And before you know it, people will start to notice and they may start to copy or mirror those things that you do. And through that mirroring, you can actually affect some change by simply uh, being the best army civilian professional that you can. And that will rub off on other people. And so finally, I, I want to talk to you about, we've, we talked and focused mostly on intermediate course graduates, but let's talk about the future. Um, people who may be on the fence or have it on their plate to, to attend the intermediate course, either face-to-face or virtual uh, in the future. So if, if I'm a supervisor out there and I've got, I'm a GS 12, 13, 14, and I've got people in the intermediate course grade range. Why do I want to send them to the intermediate course? Why do I want to give up three weeks of work uh, to, to let them go through this experience? You know, the, the key takeaway for me with the course, and we, we talk a lot about critical thinking, creative thinking, problem solving. Uh, we talked about the capstone. We talk about conflict management resolution. And there are plenty of other things that we talk about. Each student is going to take something from that. But consistently, I think what I hear from students when they come back or they, they provide feedback to me is that they can find ways to get along better with their colleagues. Because through the self-awareness that they experience over that three-week period, they understand that people don't see things the same way that I do. And just because I recognize that now, I can actually get into a better dialogue with the other person because I recognize that Bob's not an idiot. Bob just sees things differently than I do. Recognizing their different perspectives. Folks have the opportunity to go back. Yes, we want them to apply the tools that we've talked about. But as long as they can relate, interact, and create a dialogue with their teammates, with their supervisor, that's what I think students are are relaying back to me. And I had a, a wonderful interaction probably two months ago. Um, a woman in the course said that her supervisor had gone through the intermediate course months beforehand. And she was excited to come to the course because she saw a change in the way that her supervisor engaged with the employees. That's the key with the intermediate course. That supervisor, and I don't know who it was, and I, and I don't know the whole circumstances, but this woman felt strongly enough about it to say, she was different after she left the intermediate course. She found ways to work better with people. And I think that's the key component with the intermediate course. People will leave this course and probably find ways to be a better team player 
to be a better colleague, uh, to be a little bit more proactive and looking for change. That's the key component. And I think that's what we'll, you'll see with an intermediate course graduate. I really do appreciate that, Mark. And I really appreciate this conversation that we've had today. And um, I just want to tell you that it's it's always a pleasure to work with you. And it's been a real pleasure to have you on the Leader Up podcast. And um, thank you for everything that you do for the civilian education program. And thank you very much for being with us today on Leader Up. Thank you, David. I appreciate the invitation. and I would love to come back uh, at some other time. And thank you for what you do, as well as what Chad does to put these podcasts on, because this is an important venue uh, to reach out to not just previous intermediate course students, but as well as prospective um, intermediate course students who may be thinking about coming themselves. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. And Mark is talking, of course, about our producer, Mr. Producer Chad Cardwell, who is the actual brains behind the Leader Up podcast. And yeah, Chad, thank you for everything that you do also. So Leader Up audience, if you're an intermediate course graduate, think about the things that we've talked about today with uh, Mark Schmidt and uh, review those goals. And if you haven't gone through the intermediate course and you're in that grade range, come on down. We'll, we'll get you taken care of. And please join us again next time for another edition of Leader Up. As always, if you have any questions or feedback or would like to learn more about our podcast, please check the description for our email and for our website. Thanks for listening.